Hi, everybody. This is the Inspire View series, and my name is Sharice Boucher. I'm a momentum strategy coach, and you can find me at shariceboucher.com. I am so excited because I am entering year three of this series, and I really never even thought it would go this far, <laughs> but I enjoy doing it so much and sharing people's stories of inspiration and it helps to motivate us to see our own possibilities. So that is why I'm continuing it because I think it's partly selfish reasons because I get a lot out of it myself. Today, I am like crazy excited to introduce you to somebody that I just recently uh, met, met on <laughs> Facebook. Thank goodness for Facebook and connecting us with awesome people. Um, Maggie Cook Garcia. You may not really know her, but I bet you know her. So <laughs> she is a C-level executive, entrepreneur, author of the book Mindful Success, How to Use Your Mind to Transform Your Life, international keynote speaker, humanitarian, and creator of Maggie's award-winning all-natural fresh salsas and dips food manufacturing company who distributes its products across the U.S. Maggie Salsa can be found in stores like Walmart, Sam's, Whole Foods, the Kroger Company, Harris Teeter, and several other supermarkets. And I'm sure now bells are starting to ring for you. <laughs> she is now a minister and is dedicated to spreading the awareness of peace throughout the world. And she's also a coach, so she helps people see their visions too. But Maggie's story has very humble beginnings and a very unusual upbringing for a lot of people. And I don't really think that starting a salsa company was on her radar. <laughs> so welcome, Maggie. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I didn't want to delve too much into it. I've read your story a few times now because it's, inspiring to read it <laughs> and so share with us a little bit about how this even happened because I don't think too many people you know a lot of people have a dream and they they set their sights towards it and that's what they push towards but then other people things just seem to fall in their lap which um, is sort of how your story goes but with very unexpected beginnings to how you even got here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was uh, born in a, in a uh, orphanage in Mexico. And well, I'm going to start with my name because people know me by Maggie Cook, but my actual name is Maria Magdalena de la Cruz Co Garcia. <laughs> so I was born in an orphanage in Mexico and I have 68 brothers and sisters. My parents adopt, adopted 60 kids and took in another 200 kids uh, to raise them and give them a place to stay and feed them. And in that place, I was very, uh, I experienced a lot of poverty and I experienced a lot of misfortune. And one of the biggest things that I always held for in my soul was to be able to get out of there and do something big, something that would change my life, but also transform and help transform the lives of millions of people. And I had that passion because I wanted to come out of there so bad. And uh, when I was in high school, I got really good at basketball because I started playing basketball with uh, in the dirt court at the orphanage in Mexico, literally in the mountains. And I started to play. I remember watching Michael Jordan and started doing my moves and I would bandage my, my head, my face, and I would practice dribbling and all that. And I got really, really good. And by the time I graduated high school, I got recruited to play basketball for the Mexican national team in Mexico City. And they really, really wanted me. They sent me a letter. My father took me up there. And uh, we, we came back to the ranch, to the orphanage. And I, we waited for about three months. And uh, we didn't hear back from them. And my father said, well, we don't know. You know, maybe this is not meant to be. So one day I go out and play football with my brothers, American football. And Julio, one of my adopted brothers, passes me a pass. And I catch it really beautifully <laughs> and I break my collarbone uh. and so I landed on, on my shoulder, break my collarbone and uh, go to my father and he's a doctor and he looks at me, grabs me by the shoulders and says, your dreams are over. But one of the things that I've always had was that no matter what happened and no matter what the, it, it, how bad the circumstances got, I always was very optimistic and always had that mentality of something's better is going to happen. There's a reason why this happened. I have that. I don't know why. And so 
three days later, the Mexican national team calls and I can't go. So I was feeling it, you know, but in, in spite of that, I was still very, very believing that something better was going to happen. And what happens with that, and I realized now in my adult life that when you keep believing that you begin to manifest the things that, that even better things, the, the, the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, opens up the opportunities, circumstances, people that you never imagined because you have that positive mindset. It's like a magnet. You begin to attract those things. So my parents took a bus with all my 68 brothers and sisters and we came out to the U.S. Oh, that's a bit loud. It was. <laughs> By well, the time we got here, we were all tired, you know, and smiling. <laughs> But uh, we got invited to a uh, picnic in the state of West Virginia. It was a fundraiser for to support the orphanage. And I remember pulling in, we pulled in in the bus and there was a picnic area and then there was a basketball court and one of those outdoor basketball courts that were old and ruggedy. And we saw it and we just ran to it and picked up the ball and started playing. Well there, this is four months later, I happened to be the coach of the University of Charleston and she saw me play and she told my father, went and looked for him and said, you know what, who is that? I want her to come play for me on a scholarship. And so that's how I came here to the United States. And I am here today and I'm doing what I'm doing because of that opportunity of opening up and believing that there's something better. And every time that, that you do that, you will begin to attract manifest things that that you're, it's kind of like whatever your energy is like, you attract more like of it from it or of it. So. And that's a huge thing to be aware of. And I know, you know, I wish I'd known that years ago, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I think it comes well for you, you started young, which is yes. great. It was like always in you, but I think a lot of us are like, it's something that's learned and somehow mm -hmm. comes along our path you know, where we discover that, hey, you know, I really need to be aware mm -hmm. of what I'm putting out there energetically, essentially, right. you know, like what I'm thinking, how I'm acting, how I'm mm -hmm. just being, mm -hmm. um, because like attracts like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and until you, it crosses your path, and mm -hmm. you start seeing evidence of it, um, it's, it doesn't seem like a real thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you probably come across some people who Mm -hmm. We're like, what? Like, that's how's that possible? The thing is, when you set your mind to something and you want to do it, and you you see goodness and you'll see positivity and you see nothing but that, it's not just your mind that's thinking that; it's everything else that's within your body. Every cell in your body is responding to that. So, if you continue to say that to yourself, that's why affirmations are so great, and I've used them so much because. Even though you put something up there that's not believable, you keep repeating it for 30, 40 days. And what the science say, you, once you repeat something becomes so real that it becomes believable, therefore it manifests. So you're really telling your mind, which is all a group of cells in that organ, in, in that organ, forming that organ, but everything else is the same thing, but it's just indifferent. So you're responding to all those things. And what is a cell? And you go down to the nucleus, what is their energy? Nothing, you know, what is that? Right. So, is that God? What is that? But right. all that, every single system is responding to that request that you're saying, yes, I know there's something better. There's something better, no matter if the horriblest things ever happened to you. You put that there and it just becomes like an escalating, escalating to, to attracting better, better and greater things for your life. And you just dynamically change your life. And it's just like that. It just takes a second. You just set your mind for a second. And you just believe in that and continue to do that. Continue to grow that. Even when there's not happiness, you see happiness in something and you believe, right. you, you begin to feed that and you feed it every day, then you're no longer experiencing suffering or anything. All you see is joy, even though everything else around is not joyful. That's such an important outlook. I recently did, uh, created a little 30 day challenge. I hate the word challenge. I like to call it more of an adventure. Because uh -huh. it sounds like a better word, right? <laughs> um, and it was really focusing on tiny, simple things to be grateful for. And at the end of that, I really had noticed how I was paying more attention to everything mm -hmm. that was incredible. You know, like I started with what, co like what color are you most mm -hmm. grateful for today? What thing that you see right in front of you are you most grateful for today? You know, it was very simple things and mm -hmm. it brought back a lot of memories too. Cause I went back to like what childhood toy 
Uh -huh. And as I'm like Googling pictures for yeah. some of mine, you know, I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about that. I love that thing, <laughs> you know. It was really cool. And it really does like put you in a different frame of mind mm -hmm. and in a different space where you mm -hmm. actually see more of these things that bring you joy. Yes. Yeah, it escalates. It's a different state and it happens in a second. And you yeah. can change that in a second. That's a, that's a very powerful lesson for people yes. to learn, I think. Yes. So, and with your salsa story, um, because I'm sure that was a leap of faith mm -hmm. for you. Yes. And a lot of times those leaps are hard to take, or, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of struggle with, because your brain gets too involved, like, oh my gosh, like what, what if I do this? What if this doesn't work? What if, you know, the what ifs mm -hmm. pop in. So mm -hmm. how did you just like, go for it because it kind of sounds like a lot of things in your life there's like this common thread of mm -hmm. uh, being open to opportunities and saying yes even mm -hmm. if they were scary yeses mm -hmm. <laughs> i think that what we should all approach things and it's different it's going to be different for every every person and it's going to be different for every type of business that you want to do but if you approach something as i have nothing to lose mm -hmm. I have nothing to lose. I'm just going to do this. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I was in a situation where I had graduated from the university with an interior design degree. There was a statistic that came out saying that 90 some percent, 98 percent or something of the people that graduated with my degree either couldn't find a job or had to, lose, uh, had to leave the state. And I became one of those statistics. That's so encouraging. Yes. Because <laughs> so, we share that degree. So. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I ended up uh, graduating and I was, I had a station wagon. I called it, the, I called it the Maggie Waggy. <laughs> and and I, it was white and it was long and it was old and I was driving around. I didn't have a place to stay. And I started sleeping on parking lots. And one day I was riding, driving down the road and I, my, my car exploded wow. and I just grabbed my bags. I had two garbage bags of my, all my stuff in them and I just started walking. So I was in the streets for about three months or so. And uh, that's where I kind of looked at the, 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 the uh, look at, looked at the thing of, you know, I have nothing to lose here. I, I don't have bills. I don't have, and the reason why I didn't reach out to people is because in my family in Mexico, it was because of my pride, because I had to remember something that my father had told me when I was growing up. And, and I did something that I don't even remember what I did. And he said to me, you're never going to amount to anything. You're going to die in prison and with AIDS. Exactly his words. Exactly his words. So for me to reach out to him and I'm in the street, I'm in the right. street. I didn't want him to think that his prophecy had fulfilled. So I just stayed there. And it wasn't until one day that a lady that knew me from the university was passing on the street. She saw me. She said, I know you. What are you doing? Just come on, get out of the street. Come on, let's go. And she helped me. Uh, find a place to stay and um so that was the beginning i had nothing to lose i would i had nothing you know and my friends invited me to enter salsa competition that happened several like four or five weeks later and i entered it they signed me up didn't want to go but i entered it <laughs> and i won the contest by unanimous vote and then i thought maybe i do have something here and i remember sitting there and Everybody was surrounding me. They had Mexican music. It was colorful balloons everywhere. And everybody's like, you should sell this stuff. And I'm like, you're nuts. <laughs> because it's just it, salsa, right? Well, it cost a lot of money to make one pound of that stuff if you bought it from the grocery store. And I was like, I, I will do it, but I, don't, I just, you know, don't have any money. And, you know, and there's a guy that was standing there. He was dressed in a suit and he said, you know, I've been watching you for all this time. And, and I don't know, I see something in you. And he, he reached out to his pocket and pulled out his wallet and pulled out exactly $800. And he says, here you go. He says, this is in one condition that someday you pay it for. Someday you pay it for. And because of that, I was able to start my business with nothing. Google was my main research source. Yeah. You know, I, started, I started, I designed my own labels. I got See, my that's where the design yeah. comes in handy even if we don't yeah. use the interior design degree yes. we still have the design yeah. training in our brains yes 
So I got my truck driver's license and I, and I started taking the product here and there. And then soon enough, um, I, was, I was selling it mostly to friends. And, and, and I was making a lot of $1 bills. And I remember I had a big stack of it. And I was like, oh, I'm a millionaire. You know, <laughs> I was thinking positively about becoming successful, even right. though it's so hard. And I had a list of 90 supermarkets uh, or, or over 90 supermarkets to call. And I started with the smallest to the largest. And the first 91 that I called, and I still have that list, they said, no, we don't want your products. They didn't understand the fresh concept of what we were, where right. I was. And it was a fresh, fresh pico de gallo type of salsa. And nobody had that back then. And no preservatives, no. No preservatives, yeah. nothing. And so the first 90 calls, no, we don't want your products. So I took that list and I turned it upside down. And at the very top that I had in my mind considered the largest supermarket uh, an organic supermarket in the U.S. was Whole Foods Market. Mm -hmm. So I got on the phone, I left a message, I said, you know, hey, you know, I, I, you, I'm sure you don't know me, but my name is Maria Magdalena de la Cruz Garcia. I have an awesome <laughs> I got you salsa. I think you would love it. And uh, left a message. And I was, I remember clearly where I was. I was sitting in the curbside on my Honda Civic at 6 p.m. on a Monday evening. And I, my, my phone rings and I answer it. And he's like, hey, is this Maggie? I'm like, yeah. He said, this is Eric from Whole Foods. And uh, we would like to try your products. I'm like, oh my gosh. So literally I drove uh, all night because I was in West Virginia to Whole Foods all night, packed my, filled up my car with salsa and I took it in and I remember walking in. I remember exactly how the room was and they were all standing. All these men were standing in a room and I'm here, this girl that started the business. And I sat down, I opened the products and they start eating and they're talking they're like whispering to each other i'm like oh my gosh what's happening <laughs> and so nothing like feeling intimidated right yeah <laughs> yeah they're, they're like we want your products they're so awesome they're amazing they taste so good when can we have them and i'm like um okay they're like how much do you need he says we need to start with ten thousand pounds of salsa and i'm like oh my god <laughs> at that time i was making about 250 pounds for for friends and um, wow, that's a big uh, jump. <laughs> that was the first ton of salsa. And I literally went up and quit my job very in, in a very professional way. I, you know, and I started making salsa for one whole week, me and another person, tomatoes. And we were literally sore from it. We cut tomatoes for a whole week. Oh my gosh. I had a ton of salsa for, for literally a ton. I drove it up to Whole Foods in a car that had an oil tank leak, a, a gas leak, and I had to put a, a, a piece of wood block on my foot because I couldn't reach the pedals. Oh my God. I, I duct taped it to my foot. <laughs> but I made it there. See, talk about perseverance. Yeah. There's points in my, in my business life that when I was trying to make it a success that it felt like I, I wanted to give up. But the thing that I did not do was I didn't stop. I just kept going. You, know, you hear the story about people uh, coming short of goal and then they sell the business and or whatever and then somebody else makes well I just kept pushing it was so hard I kept pushing pushing but believing in something bigger mm -hmm. and here all of these things are breaking through well what happened is I remember I had to get a quick loan of twenty thousand dollars to get cost of goods in that I had to prove from a friend I had to prove that I had this contract with Whole Foods and in about a week I'm gonna get 40 grand back so I did it. I, I got it. I did it. And, and I continue to do that. And what happened with Whole Foods is once you're in Whole Foods, everybody starts to look at you. Mm -hmm. Because you must mean that you're a red, reputable company, reputable product. Right. But I have to go through a very, you know, Whole Foods puts you through a very rigorous process to make sure that you're actually good and legit and the products are well and they're organic and they're natural. And so once that happened, I had other companies knocking on my door and I really didn't do much marketing or cold calls. It just started to come to me. Well, you already, you already did like 90 of them. So yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. And so and then was, they were probably all like, uh, I probably should have jumped on that when she called, you know? <laughs> well, you know, the, the state of West Virginia, it's a, it's a, it's a different state because I don't, no, uh, but they're very open to, I don't know that fresh salsa, fresh salsa is a very Mexican thing. 
-hmm. It's very embraced. There's diversity in other states. I don't think West Virginia was there yet. So I didn't get a lot of those. I did get a lot of local mom and pop stores asking for a product and I kept them even after I went really big because I wanted to honor that. Yeah. But, but uh, companies like the Kroger company, Harris Teeter, mm -hmm. um, so many different supermarkets, Sam's clubs, Costco's uh, started to come to my door and uh, Walmart, when Walmart hit, it was hugely amazing. It was such an amazing success. I, it, all, it all happened with vision boards. I didn't even call them. They called me and uh, I had a vision board and I wrote all, all everything that I wanted to do and how I wanted to attract the next biggest supermarket in the, in the country or something better. I didn't say Walmart. Right. And it came to me and when they called me, my business partner was like, it's a prank, hang up, it's a prank. <laughs> and I was like, I've, I've, I've uh, literally said affirmations for almost a month about manifesting this and how can I not believe this is real? Right. So we still had to ask per my business partner, their credentials, make sure that they were actually Walmart. Because they called me and they said, we were searching online, we saw 10 companies, we will need a salsa company and we thought yours is the best. Can you, do you want to sell to Walmart? And so within a month we were, I was up in Bentonville, Arkansas, and we, I met with the buyers for Walmart and Sam's and that's when everything started really, really big. Um, but there's, there's so many things and this uh, book, Mindful Success, it, um, there's a lot of stories that I have here, including stories from my childhood, but that kind of illustrate and show that how powerful you are in attracting things when you dare to dream, when you're courageously dare to dream and also defy the circumstances and, and obstacles that others put on you that, that you could potentially put on yourself as well. And it's very, very, very important to know that you are such a powerful spiritual being as a human in human form, right? Have the capability to really do anything, manifest anything that you want. You could even grow an extra pink if you, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now but that would be something, right? We are, we are that powerful. Um, mm. And I think it's the, the biggest thing that we all fail to, and I, and I can do it too, but I love staying inspirational and motivational for myself, is that, and I tell it in my book, is to, that we need to remember to remember how powerful we are. And, and um, the, the capability that we have to make our dreams come true, make live a happier life, even if the circumstances around us are not that happy. And what happens is that when you become that, which what you hope for, strive for, you become contagious to other people in a good way. Yeah. It starts catching up and then you, you build this momentum and it all comes back and it's all good. And yes, everybody's going to have uh, walls on the road, rocks on the road, you're going to prick your foot or something. And you just get up and just keep moving forward. Yeah, I think a lot of that is, is um, really listening within to like, if this is something you really want, connecting mm -hmm. with how passionate you are about it. Yes. You know, some things are just kind of like, eh, it's whatever, <laughs> you know, if I do that or not. But then there are those things that you're just like, God, I just love that. Like I would do this for free, you know, mm -hmm. like I would keep yes. doing this and I would, would pursue this dream no matter what. And I think those are the things, even if other people, because there are always those people who kind of question, mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. are you crazy for, for going this way? Because it might be unconventional. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to kind of keep your own navigation. Yes. That's a good, perfect example. I had a, when I started my company, I had a inspector from the FDA and the Department of Agriculture that came to my place to make sure that, because I had to rent a FDA kitchen, that I was doing all the process so that I could be approved for distribution. And the lady, her name is Teresa, and she's the head of the department, and she told me, you should not do it fresh. It's only 10, 15 days shelf life. You should just cook it like this guy and that guy. You should just cook it. I'm telling you, it's going to be an acid. Teresa, I'm going to you know, stick to what I'm doing. I know that I found technology later, in years later, that actually extends the shelf life of the product without putting any ingredients. So mm. the possibilities there. But one, I was given an award, a big award in West Virginia. Um, it was the Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. 
and uh, it was it was a huge moment for me. And she was there, and she says, "Maggie, remember when I told you that you should cook your salsa?" She says, "I'm glad you didn't listen to me, because <laughs> then you'd be like everybody else." Yes, and sometimes in order to be unique, you have to be willing to step up and do something different that nobody's done, because that's really truly you. It's unique, yeah. and there's nobody made like you. Yeah, that's important. A lot of people start seeing. Actually, I wrote a post about this the other day they start comparing and they start mm -hmm. seeing, they start listening to what other people are saying too much. And then that self doubt sets mm -hmm. in and then you're like, yes. Oh, maybe this isn't really the way I should be doing it. Or it's mm -hmm. going to be more difficult this way. Mm -hmm. But I like that you were just like, no, mm -hmm. this is the way I'm going to do it. And it, it worked. Yes. But the thing is, you know, I still business wise, I still made a list of pros and cons that nothing's going to be more stronger than your passion and your fire for making something happen because everybody's telling you, I had supermarkets because when I started my company, my business partner, which wasn't my business partner, says, what are you doing? You should quit. You're not making any money. You have $1 bills. And I called local companies. a stack of them. Was a yeah, stack. yeah, it was a stack. <laughs> but I, had a, I called local manufacturers of food products in the, in the area and they said, they're not going to listen to you. So I was like, how do you get them supermarkets? And they're like, they're not going to listen to you. It took us five years to get one product in. So mm. everybody was telling me to give up. But I just knew that if I had an opportunity because I had something that was really good, even though it was such short shelf life, if I just kept pushing and kept pushing that the breakthrough would happen, and it did, and absolutely did. And, and it, it really made people turn their heads. And this person that was my very good friend became my business partner wonder why <laughs> but uh but everything started to happen and, and develop very very beautifully and it was such a an amazing growth process for me i think as a spiritual being too and i became a teacher to all the people that i worked with and uh you know worked together with my team members the, the companies that i work with uh the supermarket and the suppliers it was such a beautiful experience from then on so somebody gave you, okay, here's something that I wondered when I read your story. Uh -huh. Somebody gave you $800. How did you even know? You're like, how am I going to build, how am I going to make this into something on $800? I had no idea. <laughs> Were you just like, what am I going to do with 800? Where do I begin? Well, here's what I did. I bought a little chopper, a little commercial chopper. Like, you know, I don't even remember the brand name, but it was a little chopper. I bought plastic containers. Um, I bought the ingredients and I started making salsa and selling it to friends. So if I sold my, a tub, a pint, a, 12, a, a 16 ounce container for right. five bucks, and, and I had to do the math, and then I discovered wholesale. You could buy wholesale. Mm -hmm. but now I was getting cheaper produce and since still selling it for the same amount, so I was making a little bit more. So I started growing it like that, just little by little. And even though I was making 250 pounds or so of product, which was not much to sell to friends, I still continue to do that and I continue to grow. And I think people started to notice that I think it was the, the divine ability to step out of your box and go for the big guy. And yeah. they didn't even ask, you know, how big are you or anything? They're just, we just want 10,000 pounds of salsa. And that was it. You know, the rest was history. And I'm so they were like, if you're, if you're coming to us, you must have the ability to give us 10,000 pounds of salsa. The thing is, you know, the really cool thing about Walmart, too, and Whole Foods is that when I came in, they were willing to grow with me. They weren't willing to give me too much. So as soon as I got those numbers, I went in my head and I said, what do I need to make this happen? How much do I need to get in order to, 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 to get this going, to circulate this, to, to make the next thing happen? And so there was, there was a lot of um, analysis on my part and a lot of just meditating about what was the best thing to do next. And it was so cool because I wish sometimes, and during the process, I wish I had somebody that was telling me how to do it. But yeah. no, I call all the companies and they hang up on me. And I'm so glad that they didn't, I didn't have that because I was able to do it my way and not based on somebody else's limitations, which was awesome. It was like divine intervention. <laughs> That nobody spoke to you about it, so that it was. so you forced to do it the mm -hmm. way that you wanted to do it and learn on your own. Yes, actually, the company that I called, uh, which was the largest salsa company, uh, now 
they're actually the ones that bought my company. I became very good friends with them. They're so they're the ones that hang up on me. Oh, them. really? <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, Did I you tell them that? No, I didn't no. tell. <laughs> <laughs> Uncensored for this show. Yeah. Uh, but we became very, very good friends, and I ended up selling the company to them about a year and a half ago or so, and they actually ended up selling it to Campbell Soup. Wow. Which was sold last year, to Campbell Soup. And so, I think it's great that they kept, the, did you, I'm sure, you know, your business partner and you, you went through all the legal stuff to make sure that your name and everything, because uh -huh. that's what a learning process, because you start thinking about that, going from making it in your kitchen to then. Mm -hmm having to have a bigger place and then having to have a bigger place and then selling to a company like, Oh my God, that's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And the thought here's here would be my, what ifs am I going to get screwed in this deal? Or, you know, am I doing the right thing is, are they going to veer away from my standards of how I make something? Cause I'm very much a, you know, this is the way I make it. It's like my baby, right? Mm -hmm. If you make something like you can't make it the way I make it. Mm -hmm. So how did you get past <clears throat> that part well, of it? I think, you know, there's a lot of intuition that's involved in that. You definitely need to have some, some degree of intuition. But it's also the people that you attract. And you wonder what you why you attract the people that you attract in your life. And that's the kind of vibration that you're in. Mm. So if you try to stay in the purest vibration possible, and just being positive and, and optimistic and enthusiastic for a wonderful and better future, and not just speak for your own interest or your own pocket, but for the betterment of everything that's going on around you, including your team members, you begin to attract those things. Mm. <clears throat> and when they came to me, they actually, he wanted to buy the company. And I just knew that they're the kindest people. Mm. They're the kindest people. Jack and Annette Aronson with Garden Fresh Gourmet, the most amazing people, the biggest hearts. He reminds me so much of my father, which was a missionary in Mexico that medical attention to 300 over 300,000 people for free, the poor, wow. well, 19 churches. He's got the biggest heart, if not biggest than my, my father. And, and I really looked up to him. So that kind of energy was I, I was attracting. And so I knew that everything was going to be good. And even the transition of selling the company there, I had the privilege and the honor to be with their people, their team, which is such a great culture because the top reflects everybody else, right? Right. And so... I was able to work with them and make the products with them. And, and it was just such a, such a wonderful experience. Oh, that's awesome. Because, you know, when, when your name is on something, you want to make sure that it, it really reflects you mm -hmm. and that, you know, your standards are maintained and everything so that it doesn't become something lesser than what you intended. But I love that how you wrap it up with the, well, my intentions were always there for <laughs> to attract the right people to help me move this forward in the, in the way that you envisioned. Mm -hmm. And, and nothing, everything that you have, it's important not to be like, you know, like I can't lose this, you know, it's my baby because nothing lasts forever. Right. What can you do to let go and release so that you can benefit others and it be a gift that's passed down? You know, yeah. That's important to think about because uh, when we get in a, in a sense of attachment, uh, form, we begin to experience things that we don't want, like fear, like mm. anxiety. And what do, we, what do we begin to attract exactly those things and more? Very true. Mm -hmm. So then how did um, your focus shift into becoming a minister and then sharing all this? Because that seems like a big, well, not yes and no. It seems like you've always lived this way anyway. But then to go from this very hugely successful business to then what you're doing now. Because mm -hmm. I know you're paying it forward. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, my father passed in 2009 and my mother remarried and left the orphanage. So uh, my brother, uh, my youngest brother, Josue, which is very young, like in his early 20s, and his wife uh, have the orphanage in Mexico. So mm. we have 31 kids, I believe, right now. Wow. that we're taken care of and we were uh, threatened by the drug cartels in Mexico that they were going to take the kids away several years ago and I ended up going down there and uh, literally my brother called there he said there's 50 people coming they're going to take the kids and I said no they're not so I flew there that evening I was signing books 
I arrived in Mexico at 5 a.m. I don't know how that happened because I've never been able to go to Mexico so quickly. It was divine guidance. And I got there and I installed the most expensive phone system in the mountains for, to, to call for help if anything happened. And I went into town and I had, there were barricades of the, the uh, military and the federalities entrance and exits of the city because they were fighting three cartel, uh, drug cartels. And I made friends with him and I talked to the commandante of the federal police and became very good friends. And I said, if we need anything, can we call? We're an orphanage over there in the mountains and, you know, deep in the mountains. And they're like, sure. So I made sure that I went out to the community, to the mountains and told everybody, I'm here, I'm in charge. I have a phone system and the federalities and the military are with me and I have weapons. <laughs> I had weapons. I had a, a 38 special and a, uh, a shotgun, a chisa, it's called a chisa, handmade shotgun that we made at the orphanage. It's all we had, but I, I did say, you know, we have weapons. And so that type of service has kind of moved me to become a minister, but to also protect uh, uh, the lives of people. So we ended up uh, uh, putting the kids in a tiny room for 30 days. And I slept outside with a gun in the concrete floor with one of my adopted brothers. And there's a dog that kept barking. Her name was La Muñeca. I have pictures of all of this. And uh, she kept barking at night on anything that moved. So I had the brilliant idea because I was so tired from sleeping, you know, out there. I can imagine. Stay awake. So I put a rope around my waist and I tied it to her. So anytime she would, she, she could move me, I would wake up. Only one time that we go down and we saw flashlights come in and we shot our guns, but um, in the air. I don't want to ever shoot anybody. Right. Uh, but uh, we, a, a guy that ended up breaking in later on and took a kid and the military and the police came in and they set up snipers on the property. Mm. That's when I said, you know, my brother said, you brought peace to him in this home. The kids knew. Uh, when I came back, I knew that I didn't need guns, but people needed to see guns in order to feel protected. Right. Because I knew that I that there was this this power around us, this protection around us, and nothing was going to happen because we they were being taken care of and protected at, at a much higher level. Yeah, but that kind of service kind of reminded me of what my father did, and so I I I love the idea of being able to help people in many levels in many different ways, and I'm not sort of and I'm a, a minister a minister of a certain religion or a certain thing. I'm a minister of of all people for all mm -hmm. people. And, and the reason I say that, as I mentioned earlier, is that I, I feel like I can relate to so many people in so many different ways. Right. I've experienced a lot and I'm able to, I've been able to help a tremendous amount of people in their journey. And we continue to do what we're doing at the orphanage in Mexico. Uh, that continues to grow and change. And uh, I'm here in St. Peter's, Florida, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, I'm uh, uh, with First Unity Spiritual Campus here. And, uh, but now I've decided to write a second book and I'm writing a second book and I'm going to start uh, doing some speaking engagements more than before because I've done keynotes all over the country and, and outside of the country, uh, but really focusing on sharing the message and, and what I've been through and what I can, I, add the, I what I know that other people can do with our lives if you just are willing to believe and take the, the step, just take one step forward each and every day and you'd be amazed that you have to do it courageously and you have to defy the circumstances that others put in front of you or that you can you might put in front of yourself that stop you from the success that you truly want to achieve yeah that's an incredible message and it's so great that you that you're sharing that and what a journey i mean so do you still go to mexico then because you've obviously got yes. a lot of family down there and yes. you help them out. That's that had to have been scary too. It was was it scary. like that when you grew up down there too? Or has it gotten worse and you were like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna take hold of this situation? I remember when I was growing up that I saw I heard a lot of uh, gunshots around us. I I saw it, my dad shot a lot of guns. I don't know what he was shooting at, uh, but he was tell I was run to the house and uh, but this time around, it was, I, was, I was scared. I will admit I was very scared, but I was also willing to give my life because I, I could not let, we rescued these kids that were sexually abused by 
drug cartel members and they're like two year olds, two oh girls. I mean, I have pictures of all of this stuff and it's pretty, I'm, I hope I don't start crying. <laughs> it's pretty, um, pretty dramatic, the things that can happen. But we also have the ability to step up and at least pray or at least meditate about that or at least do something about something that makes a, a different a difference in people's lives such as those kids and i tell people you know i am me maggie i am a uh someone that somebody else helped that was in that orphanage and because of that gift that somebody did donated or something did something i am here today alive and telling the story and living my life and inspiring people and anybody else can any about any any other kid is that potential capability or more yeah or at their own degree or whatever they can, they're capable of doing. I'm sure you've got a whole slew of proud brothers and sisters all. However are. many there are now, <laughs> 60 plus. Yes, yeah. they are. And I tell them, they're like, man, some of the little kids are like, man, yeah, I want to be just like you. I'm like, don't be like me. Uh, be your own thing. But you can like, you know, I can inspire you. But don't just be just like me. You know, it's like right. I want to be Superman or Batman. People ask me, who's your superhero? I'm like, I don't have one. I just want to be like me. You know, I want to do my thing. I want to be my own superhero. And uh, that's what I love talking to kids about. Because yeah. they can create their own thing. They can. And it, I think that's fantastic because mm -hmm. the way education is structured, it's, it's crushed a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. um, even I've noticed because I've got two children and from how I grew up, I mean, there was a lot of, a lot more creativity mm -hmm. in how I went to school than how they are now. Well, mm -hmm. my daughter just started college this year, so, but she was in a, I put her intentionally in creative um, schools where she could focus on her art. But, you know, I see it a lot with my son too. It's just, it's, it's kind of stifling and it doesn't allow them to express themselves as much. So I think it's great to have people out there to specifically talk to children and encourage their creativity and their dreams and and the possibilities that they can achieve things like this. And especially, you don't have to come from some rich family or anything. You can come from very meager beginnings mm -hmm. and achieve Absolutely. a lot. Absolutely. That's fantastic. They must get excited to see you down there. Oh, I, have video. <laughs> I think I have video on my Facebook page. It's. Uh, at Maggie Cook LLC and there's a video when I came to visit and, and they saw me I came by surprise and they all ran to me and hugged me like they bumped into me and jumped on me I just love that I just absolutely love that that's fantastic and do you is there um, any sort of fundraising efforts or things that go directly to that orphanage or yes. how, how does that work well he's got a <laughs> website it's called golgivenewlife.org and the an organization is called Give New Life, but the website is gogivenolife.org, and you could contact them that way. There's they use a, 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 a service from Virginia to get funds through them, and it's explained on the website. And uh, a lot of times people reach out to me, and then I'm able to connect them to my brother, and they can do send directly funds to them. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, but those are the ways. So fantastic that he took that on. Yes. And he's been through a lot for such a young guy. Yeah. And he's done so much and he's protected and he's provided for all these kids. Uh, the way that the orphanage is run right now is amazing. Even me walking through the doors now, it's really cool because he grew up in what I grew up in. So we both experienced things dramatically that we never wanted to experience again. So, uh, the way that he's doing it, he's doing it from the perspective of how he grew up. So you feel so much more love and you, you feel all this stuff going on that it's just so amazing. And he's able to do that in a way that it's never been done before to the point that we have kids from other orphanages, orphanages that hear about us and they escape those orphanages <sighs> up to ours. It's so amazing. Incredible. Yes. That should be a model then for the other orphanages to, is, to model after. It is. It is. And you know, the, 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 CP, the Child Protective Services in Mexico, which is called a BIF, the BIF, they actually made him the 
lead the head of instructor to, to teach policy, to teach how he's running the orphanage to the other orphanages. If, if they don't comply, they're going to they're gonna wow. shut them down. And that's wow. the new legislation that's being passed in Mexico because of that, what's going on. That is so exciting. Yes. Wow. And the thing about that, though, too, is money, funds uh, can be very mismanaged, but he's got a really good system that people can take advantage. Right. Of. And so that's why he's the head of, and the DIF is really looking at this because if he sets some things in place, they won't be able to make all the money and not give food to the kids. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because it could be very corrupt. Orphanages yeah. are very corrupt. That's why there's no orphanages in the U.S. So if they don't comply with that system, they're going to shut them down. Wow. Mm -hmm. Good. That's great. And everything that he's doing is not self-centered. Everything is all giving. He's got a big heart. Yeah, it sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it, especially to have grown up that that way in that environment and then to continue it as an adult so yes. that other kids can benefit from it. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty inspiring. That you is. get a lot of inspiring people in your family. <laughs> I, know. I know they're amazing. That's awesome. So, amazing. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, I think, I feel like I could talk to you for another couple hours, but I don't want to take up all your <laughs> Maybe we'll do it again. Yes, that would be great. That would be fantastic. We'll definitely stay in touch. And, um, and well, book number two, we'll have to talk about that too. Yes. And I'll have a link to this book on my website. Um, so everybody can find this interview, your bio, um, links to contact you and a link to your book as well at shereeseboucher.com slash the inspire view series 2017 That's um, also on youtube so it's just that the links won't be there on youtube but uh, they are there on my website where they have their happy home for everybody to to find it and if, what is your um what is a good way to contact you just so that we've got it in here the best way to contact me is through email, and it's basically maggiecook.org, and it's M-A-G-G-I-E-C-O-O-K.org. Uh, my number is 304-550-5460. If anybody wants to reach me that way, I get a lot of texts and calls from people, and I don't mind. When I started my salsa company, every container had that number, so I'm very oh, wow. glad to your service. <laughs> Well, you would be getting a call at one in the morning. Hey, is this Maggie Salsa? I'm like, yeah, this is Maggie Salsa. So, like literal and literally yeah. Maggie. Not yes. even like some big yes. company with a call center or something. Right. <laughs> yep. So my number is 304-550-5460. And those are the best ways to contact me. My website is maggiecook.org. I'm going to be working on that. But uh, that's pretty much it. And Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Maggie Cook LLC. And we can expect to see you in um, plenty of speaking engagements. Yes. Plenty to yes. share your, your motivation and inspiration because that's but the mindset thing and the positivity goes a long way as you mm -hmm. have been yes. over and over again in your own life. Yes. So it's not disputable, really. <laughs> right. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you again so much for taking the time to You're very welcome. do this with me. You're very welcome, and the little dog is going to say bye. Oh. <laughs> she was very quiet. Yes, I'm glad. <laughs> Normally, when I say hello, they start barking. Oh, yeah, because they think somebody's there. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you okay, so much. Thank you. Thank you.